dying, Christ destroyed our death. Rising, Christ restored our life. Christ will come again in glory. As in baptism, Ruth shall in Spain put on Christ. So in Christ may Ruth be clothed with glory. Here and now, dear friends, we are God's children. What we shall be has not yet been revealed. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Those who have this hope purify themselves as Christ is pure. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of hell and death. Because I live, you shall live also. Friends, we have gathered here to praise God and to witness to our faith as we celebrate the life of Ruth Sheldon Spain. We come together in grief, acknowledging our human loss. May God grant us grace that in pain we may find comfort, in sorrow, hope, and in death, resurrection. Let us bow together in prayer. Gracious God, we know your spirit is in this place, in this beautiful sanctuary, which meant so much to Ruth Sheldon Spain. For many years, she worshiped here. She sang your praises and prayed. And so we gather now remembering her in honor of her in this time of celebration of Ruth's life. And so we thank you for all who have come from far and near, who hold Ruth in such high regard, who have loved her so dearly, and whose love will continue even now. As we talk together, we think of Ruth, we smile, we know, gracious God, that truly she was a gift from your great heart. And so we give you thanks in these moments of worship as we gather together with one another in honor of Ruth Shelton Spain and to your honor and glory, O oh Jesus our Lord. Amen. Truly one of the most wonderful psalms of comfort, one that many of you probably know by heart, the 23rd Psalm. Let us now join together in the 23rd Psalm, the Old Testament lesson. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely the goodness and mercy shall follow me. Praise be to God. <clears throat> Ruth Shelton, Spain. April 25th, 1925, July 16, 2019. Those two dates are significant bookends to the life of our dear Ruth whose wonderful, colorful, meaningful life we celebrate today. Ruth, 
the fourth child of William Thomas Shelton and Ethel Minnetree Shelton, who in the old fashioned styles addressed one another as Mr. Shelton, Mrs. Shelton. Sally Ann, their first daughter, was an invalid who with a loving care bestowed upon her lived to be actually 29 years old. Then there was daughter Carrie. Then son Minnetree, Buck or Uncle Buck. And finally the baby, Boop. There was another important member to the family, Texana, the housekeeper and caregiver for the children. Now, Mrs. Uh, Shelton, you will hear in just a moment, was very busy involved in running a large boarding house. So you can understand what an important addition was Texana to the family. For the large boarding house had eight rooms and one bath <laughs> over, over on 35th Street. And as you're going around it, whoops, a, a few circles today, you might see 25th Street, there may be just one or two houses left, all the rest now ship, uh, shipyard parking lot. But there, there it was, the eight room boarding house, and Mrs. Shelton was very busy running that boarding house. Now, Mr. Shelton, along with his industrious wife, owned the house, which was home to many of the shipyard employees, and they were served every day, breakfast, lunch and dinner. Hearing about Mrs. Shelton's busy schedule, one can understand why Ruth, as a baby and a toddler, cried for Texana when she needed mother. Big Brother Buck vividly remembered that and frequently repeated the story. As Ruth remembered her childhood, she often recalled how when she needed to get up at night, her father would take her by the hand and escort her to the bathroom. After all, it was a big house with many strange men. Born in Newport News, Ruth's childhood was molded by her family of origin, of course, but also by the many influences of the neighborhood within the six blocks from where you and I sit this very moment. And as we know, she lived her adult life just a very few miles from here as well but I'm getting ahead of her story, Ruth's story. Ruth attended the John W. Daniel Elementary School and Newport News High School. Anybody in here remember that? Those days when there were only 11 grades in school, and so Ruth graduated after 11 years in school. After finishing high school, she got a job working at a bank, always referred to Nobody can remember what the name of the bank was, but always referred to as Jimmy Bridger's Bank. <laughs> Jimmy Bridger's being a banker who was a dear friend for life and a longtime member here at Trinity Church. And of course, if he owned a bank, he was church treasurer. <laughs> for all of his life, Ruth never missed greeting Jimmy on a Sunday morning, scratching his head as she went down the aisle to the pew. Now that's what the family said, and I've been thinking about that. I think, as I recall, maybe Jimmy Bridger sat over here, and maybe as she came down, she'd just kinda pat him on the head, scratch his head, every Sunday for as long as Jimmy Bridger's lived. For indeed, he was a very dear friend who had employed Ruth, fresh out of high school at his bank. Well, again, I'm, I'm getting a little bit ahead of Ruth's story. As a teen, Ruth and her girlfriends loved to sit on the porch of the boarding house. When did they sit on the porch of the boarding house? In the afternoon, just after the shipyard whistle signaled the end <laughs> of, now correct me on this if I'm wrong, about four o'clock, that's the end of the second shift, right? Well anyway, Ruth and her girlfriends knew <laughs> And that's when they'd sit on the porch looking at and commenting on the stream of young men before them, waiting for the bus or walking to their cars. Ooh, they whisper, he's handsome. No, he's too short. He's tall, too old. So, 
Such was Ruth's life with her friends on the boarding house porch. It was one of her girlfriends who introduced her to a very special young man whom the friend had dated, but felt he wasn't her style. But you would like him, she told Ruth. Thereupon, the friend made arrangements to Ruth to meet him and to go on a hayride. So Ruth met the young man from Dinwiddie County who had come to work in the shipyard. Yes, Ruth met Ivan Spain, and as they say, the rest is history. He might not have been the friend style, but he sure was Ruth's. They married and celebrated 59 years together. Praise God. Family was always important to Ruth. Ruth loved her family. The big extended family of aunts and uncles and cousins gathered frequently at the boarding house on 35th Street. Their heritage reached back over a century to another era and to another area of Virginia. That area of Virginia, family legend recounted how great-grandmother Sarah Minitree saw Grant Byrne Richmond a long time ago. Indeed, the family was fiercely close. It may well have been Ruth's clan who coined the phrase, it takes a village, and that village was their family. Ruth was raised through her childhood with the embedded concept of the value of family. So when she married Ivan, she lovingly assimilated the Sheltons and the ministries with the Spains of Dinwiddie. She welcomed them with great love and great hospitality, which lasted a lifetime and still lasts to this day and will last into the future. Ruth's routine as a wife began in their early marriage and continued for decades. This was it. At 3 p.m. every day, she took her bath, fixed her hair, and dressed up for Ivan's homecoming from his daily work at the shipyard. At 5.30, when he got home, he would always announce himself, Ruth, I'm home, and proceed to eat the three or four course meal which Ruth had prepared between her chores and her dress up time. Now, sometimes she'd sneak in one last cigarette before Ivan's arrival. <laughs> Ivan and Ruth's relationship was notable. Men, take notice. Every Christmas, without fail, Ivan would give Ruth three gifts. A ring, perfume, and a nightgown. Now, in all honesty, I must relate that those yearly gifts came after their first Christmas, when he gave her something for the house. Was it a vacuum cleaner or something for the kitchen? Nobody remembers. But Ruth's reaction to the, that gift on that first year caused Ivan to think the next year of something more to her liking for Christmas gifts. Hence, the ring, the perfume, and the nightgown. Ruth and Ivan's marriage was blessed with three children, Susan, then five years later, Eddie. And when Susan was 17, David came along. Ruth was diligent in keeping house. After all, she had learned the value of hard work in the boarding house on 35th Street. Cleaning, laundry, cooking. Was that when she learned the recipe for those famous yummy rolls? Ruth was also the catalyst for the family activities. It was mostly she, although Ivan did help, but mostly she who saw to the children finishing their homework. After homework was finished, Susan and Eddie and David knew that their friends were always welcome in their home. No matter how many, their friends were always welcome. What a wonderful gift that was from Ruth and Ivan. And frequently, the friends were invited to stay for dinner too. Mom will feed you, she'll make it work. 
and Ruth always did. It was also Ruth who, because of her great love of art, music, history, and all things cultural, saw to it that her children experienced such things. They took art lessons, visited art museums, they went to concerts, they went to historic battlefields, revolution and civil war battlefields, or as Ruth might have said, the war between the states. It was all important to Ruth. Incidentally, she referred to anyone north of Richmond as a Yankee. <laughs> but she loved us and we knew it. Indeed, her love went far and wide. Recently reflecting on her life, Ruth said to Susan, I want to leave this world a better place. Well, there's no doubt about that. To begin with, how many blankets did she knit for Warm Up America? Many, many, many blankets. She was an officer for the Lackey Free Clinic, also the League of Downtown Churches and the Industrial Commercial Ministries, which originated right here at Trinity Church. She championed the underdog, those who needed help. Once there was an Asian woman, a single mother with two sons. Another time, a Cuban family. Immigrants they were. She welcomed them. In the 60s, when daughter Susan wanted to invite an African American to preach here from Trinity's pulpit, it was obvious there would be censure from some members of the congregation. Against all odds, Ruth encouraged Susan to issue the invitation. The preacher did at last receive the invitation, knowing the story about the young woman who had invited him. I don't know if he ever knew the backstory about Ruth's encouragement, but now we do. Ruth loved Trinity. She served this church in so many ways. What a joy. Now five generations of Sheltons and Spains and still counting. Ivan always said he was a Christian before he met Ruth. <laughs> Disciples of Christ, that is. Oh yes, Ivan was a Christian before he met Ruth and then he became a Methodist. <laughs> a loyal, dedicated Methodist and a well-respected one at that. Now, there's one other aspect about Ruth Spain that we all knew. She seldom had a thought she wouldn't speak. <laughs> for better or for worse, we didn't need to wonder what Ruth was thinking. She generally let us know. This week, there was a post on Facebook from a young woman raised here in Trinity who knew Ruth Spain literally from the time this young woman was in the cradle roll. Let me share her words. <clears throat> she was a special lady. I have many great memories from Trinity, but the best was when I saw her in the lingerie section of Dillard's the day before I got married. I was stocking up on my honeymoon attire and she patted my arm, raised her eyebrows, winked, and told me to have a lovely wedding. My favorite quote from Ruth was also about a wedding. And you'll have to excuse me if I slip into, as I hear Ruth's voice, I may slip into tr Ruth's voice. I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see. Anyway, we were having a discussion about the duties of the bride's mother. Those duties of a bride's mother were obvious and numerous. Then Ruth said, but remember, the mother of the groom wears beige and keeps her mouth shut. <laughs> Good advice from Ruth Spain, but advice that she herself seldom practiced. As I said, we usually knew what Ruth was thinking. She was forthright, all right. So we rolled our eyes and shrugged our shoulders. That was Ruth. 
a unique combination of sugar and spice, the spice sometimes being just a dash of pepper. And we loved her for it. God created us all unique human beings. Thank you, Lord. But honestly, in Ruth Sheldon, Spain, God created a most uniquely unique human being. Hallelujah. In planning this celebration of life for Ruth Sheldon, Spain, the family shared that she, Ruth, had expressed a desire not to have the scripture read which refers to the good woman or the wife of noble character, depending on your translation. 31st chapter of Proverbs, verses 10 to 31. Look it up when you go home. I'm not going to read it as per Ruth's wishes, but if you open your Bible sort of right to the middle, and then it's the next book after Psalms, Proverbs, Chapter 31, verses 10 through 31. Read it yourself. But I have wondered why Ruth didn't want it read. Was she so modest she thought she should not be compared to the biblical woman? Knowing Ruth's good self-esteem, I soon dismissed that idea. Perhaps she was so free-spirited she did not want to be compared with the stereotype in the Bible narrative. The truth is, however, although she was progressive and somewhat a feminist in many ways, she was nevertheless traditional like this woman in Proverbs 31. Certainly, Ivan thought she was worth more than rubies. Remember the jewelry every Christmas? Also, he had full confidence in her, for she brought him good all the days of her life. She worked with eager hands, knitting for Warm Up America. Again, how many, how many blankets? Many. She provided good food for her family. Even great-grandson Ivan commented just the night before Ruth left us. He commented that Granny made good scrambled eggs and bacon. She set about her work vigorously, no doubt about that. She opened her arms to the poor and extended her hands to the immigrant. She was clothed in fine linen and the latest fashions. Oh yes, Ruth always looked very well put together, beautifully put together. She looked good. Ivan was respected at the shipyard and by all the laity, here at Trinity Church. Ruth spoke with frankness and often wisdom and looked well to the ways of her household. Her children arise up and call her blessed while knowing and loving the reality of her unique person. Talk to Susan and Eddie and David. Chat a while about Granny with her grandchildren and her dear little great grand. Her friends loved her and praised her. It's all there about Ruth in Proverbs 31. No matter what she thought, it's there. Read it. The one scripture, however, Ruth did want read was the brief passage in John chapter 14. Verses 1 through 3. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. John, 14th chapter. Three precious verses. Knowing Ruth's story, we understand how she could relate to what Jesus was describing about his father's house with its many rooms. So did her father have a big house with many rooms, a big boarding house. 
And as there is room in all Jesus' father's house for all God's children, so the house of Ruth's life had room for all her children and her children's friends and her children's children, room for the poor and outcast, room for aliens from other lands, yellow, black, red, and white, precious in God's sight, and precious in Ruth's sight. And according to recent conversations about her beloved United Methodist Church, there was plenty of room in Ruth's house for rainbow people as well. Hallelujah. The celebration of Ruth's unique life gives us so much to ponder and so much for which to be grateful. Truly, in knowing Ruth Sheldon Spain, we have all been blessed. Gracious, loving God, we thank you for the life of our dear Ruth Sheldon Spain. Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us in remembering my grandmother's life. My name is Amy and I'm Susan's oldest daughter. Amy Ruth. Yes, Amy Ruth. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'd like to share a few memories of Granny that were shared with me, um, friends and family. Um, one of my oldest childhood friends, Megan Kelly, wrote me and said, I'm not going to lie, every time Granny said that she liked my hair, it made me really happy. It sounds shallow, but it made me feel like I had done something right. Another childhood friend, Erin McGee, she, she said, Granny and I crossed paths at Harris Teeter a number of years ago. I left my cart and purse to go give her a hug. 
Granny looked me dead in the face. She said she was happy to see me, but to never leave my purse in my cot again. <laughs> Aaron said, I never leave my purse in the cart, and I always hear Granny Ruth in my head. Cousin Sarah, Sarah Gill Campbell, she said, an antidote about Aunt Ruth. Countless people in my life, including two of my littlest nephews, have giggled over me telling them how Aunt Ruth would say while they were playing cards, you have to breast your cards. <laughs> in her Tidewater accent. And she's the reason that every arm of Sarah's family brings dominoes on vacation or at any chance they might, when they might all be together for an evening of fun. Sarah also said, I have dreams of her yeast rolls and cucumber pickles from her garden, and I wish I had both recipes. My sister-in-law, Julie Leggett Hyatt, wrote, my fondest memories of our time together were spent picking blue crabs. Few people have the patience and skill to work for that sweet reward. Julie remembered Christmas time gathered around the fireplace, drinking her daddy's recipe for the strongest eggnog ever made, <laughs> eating her delicious chocolate chest pie while listening to childhood stories. And she said, I love you, Granny. Um, Betty Frankhauser wrote, Ruth Spain, what a beautiful lady. I loved her from the very first time I met her many, many years ago. And her fondest memory is when she and Betty's mom became good friends from the very first 4th of July party at her house. She said, I can see the two of them sitting at the kitchen table playing dominoes and giggling at each other like schoolgirls, while Ivan and Minitree were out in the backyard shucking corn. She said, Nancy and I would be in the kitchen getting food ready before all the folks came back from tubing on the James River. The two of them would just continue playing dominoes laughing. On one of those 4th of July event events, Ruth brought mother her own set of dominoes, which her mom always treasured. My husband, Mike, said that Granny always made him feel at home. His fondest memories were of Granny holding our kids and of her delicious cooking. He also enjoyed going over to Granny's house and playing dominoes, and he thought it was very sweet that Granny would babysit for Ivan every Wednesday afternoon after preschool. Um, and I'd like to share just a little bit about Granny's name. Ruth had a Granny, and therefore she wanted to be called Granny. She wanted her kids, grandkids to know she wasn't a Gigi, she wasn't a Mimi, or a Gammy. Starting on the day of a baby's birth, she would say, Granny, 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 Granny. <laughs> Wait, I'm not done. There were three more. Granny, 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 <laughs> granny. And then also when they started walking, she would go, come to Chigani. Come, come, come. Um, Granny's three great-grandsons were with her on Monday night. And when Preston went into her room, he said in his sweet voice, Granny's sleeping. I love you, Granny. And like Libby said, Ivan told Granny he liked it when she would cook for him and let him watch Thomas the Train. And William said he liked it when she would play the game Monday morning. She would say, here it is, Monday morning, look at all these dirty clothes. I'm going to pick them up and scrub, 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 scrub. And then Granny would tickle you until you begged for mercy. <laughs> and my favorite memories, of course, and I'm sure all the grandkids and great-grandkids will remember the holidays spent at her house along with her special decorations. And I know if you ever had the chance to try these, you will remember the lemon and chocolate chest pies, pancakes, rolls, and roast. Um, one special memory I have is when I was five years old and Kathy Davis was four, my granny walked us up to the Mariner's Museum to have a picnic in the woods, and she poured milk in these tiny little Dixie cups, and we used a tree stump as a table to eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. It was so simple, and yet it had a lasting impression on me. The majesty of the woods and a kind-hearted grandmother. Her door was always open to visitors. She always let us spend the night. When I was afraid to go into the ocean by myself, I convinced her to go in with me. <laughs> she was known for having a clean house, and once she had grandkids, she thought we should get in on the action too. <laughs> if we complained of being bored, she would say, well, I'll show you how to have some fun. So she filled a large bucket with soapy water and then handed us a scrubbing brush. And next thing you know, the grandkids were having fun scrubbing the whole patio and Granny's exterior walkway sparkled. <laughs> Granny was a hard worker. She worked hard every day of her life in every capacity. And I'll never forget when my oldest son, Ivan, was born in 2010. Granny baked me an apple pie from scratch, loaded it into the car, drove it to my house, and walked it up to the walkway. And then she proceeded to rock Ivan to sleep. 
Granny loved to hold her great grandbabies, and she was known for singing the babies to sleep. Um, and in closing, I just want to read a little something that Andrew Hyatt, my brother, posted while he was in St. Croix en route to get back. He wrote um, a letter to Granny. He said, uh, Dear Granny, I genuinely love spending time with you one-on-one. -on -one. I loved our midweek dates, which included lunches at Danny's, Anderson's, or circa 1918, followed by movies at AMC or The Narrow. I always loved popping in to say hello. Of course, I would raid your refrigerator for something cold to drink, like iced tea and the top drawer that had the little Debbie snacks. Your food was always a treat, whether it was blue crabs on the back patio just because, dinners to give my parents a break, Easter Sundays, Thanksgiving and Christmas. Safe to say that your rolls were the best. Um, the recipe will always be a mystery. Thank you for growing the most amazing roses, Granny. I couldn't afford anything from Pollard's and Harris Teeter wasn't built, so your garden was never safe if I had a crush on someone. Thank you for hosting the best summertime baseball games in your backyard, followed by catching frogs and lightning bugs. Oh, and the sleepovers with air conditioning and cable TV. We didn't have those things at 44 Rivermont. <laughs> Andrew said, again, thank you for the one-on-one -on -one where we would play dominoes and rummy. I'd win some, you'd win some. It was just nice to be in your company. Andrew said, I'm thousands of miles away, but you have been and always, and always will be with me in my heart. I love you, Granny. So on behalf of all of us, Granny, thank you for everything. We love you. Good afternoon. I'm hoping I can get through this because I know my mother's watching. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mom, here I go. Um, I'm very honored and happy that you all are here today. You're her favorite people. Um, thank you so much for coming, and thank you so much for all the prayers and love and cards that you sent my mom and gave our family through this difficult time. On July the 16th, which I might add, was the day before Uncle Buck died, okay? So, you know, she, could, she had to catch up with him. Um, was a great day for her. She had been in so much pain, and she, you know, she prepaid her funeral 12 years ago, so she's been ready to go. But it was a joyous time for her. Libby was holding her hand, singing Amazing Grace, and my friend and Libby's daughter, my friend's sister, was with me, and Libby sang, and Mom passed, and it was beautiful, and, and she couldn't have wanted it any other way. And I know that day she had a joyous reunion with her sisters and her brother and Aunt Nancy and Kenny, and I know my dad was like, where the hell have you been for 15 years? <laughs> And if you know my father, you know he was saying <laughs> that. And now one of, one of my friends, I can't remember who it was, was saying, well, you know, your mom's probably up there telling St. Peter what to do and what needs to be cleaned and everything. And I'm, I'm sure she's, she's up there doing that. Um, when I called Frank to tell him that mom had passed, and he told me later, he said, you know, I went outside to take a deep breath and... There was thunder, there was lightning. He said, I just knew God was heralding your mother right up there. And that's probably true. She was, she was welcomed with the thunder and the lightning and, and, ever, and all her family and friends. Um, she was an amazing woman. And if you know me, you know sometimes I complained a little bit because she... <laughs> As Libby said, she always told the truth, and sometimes I didn't really like it that much, but um, <laughs> I know that I can never be the woman my mother was. She was amazing. She always dressed to the nines. She always had her hair done. She had earrings, her shoes matched. She was just unbelievable. Um, even last week, 
or maybe it was the week before that. She said, Susan, I need some face powder. Can you go get me some and make sure it's cover girl because it has a little powder puff in there and get me some Neutrogena. I don't want my wrinkles to show. <laughs> and then she'd say, I mean, really? You've broken your hip, you're in bed, you're in hospice, and you still want all this stuff. But she did, and I got it for her. Oh, she also wanted lipstick. Um, she kept an immaculate house. I mean, you know I didn't get that trait from her if you've ever <laughs> been in my house. Um, she always made homemade goodies, and they were always waiting for whoever came to the door. She was such a gracious hostess. She used, she never used paper napkins, very seldom. She had uh, cloth napkins, and she was just a true Southern lady, except maybe for her mouth sometimes. Um, she, she welcomed friends into our home. She cooked for them. When I was in college, she wrote me a letter every single day. Can you imagine? She didn't want me to go to the mailbox and, be, and it be empty. She, it might have just been three or four lines, but she wrote to me every single day. Um, she was an amazing grandmother. I could not have raised my three kids without her. And I know that they've learned just as much from her as they learned from me and my great-grandchildren, too. Um, she loved them so much, and she loved her family. Everything was family to her. Growing up, I felt like I was surrounded by a village because even if they were far away, they were there because Mom always kept in touch with everybody, and she always was like, so-and-so's doing this and so-and-so and the phone calls and everything. And I really feel that love of my family right now and my friends, but my... My family, his mother just said all, all the time that, you know, your family is really, really important to you, and I really feel that, that today. Um, she did speak her mind. Some of the people at the Chesapeake said she was quite spicy. Um, <laughs> but they loved her, and she, you know, they would come up to Eddie and I and say, oh, your mother's so sweet. And Eddie and I would look at each other and go, do you have the right woman? <laughs> Because we thought maybe they had, but she was sweet. She had a good heart, and she was very loving, and she, she would tell us what we did right or what we did wrong. Um, she had developed a very close relationship with certain people in the Chesapeake, and I have to share this one story with you. Um, she was very close to one of the housekeepers at the Chesapeake, and um, her name was Brenda. And when my mother passed, Brenda brought two of the housekeepers down to my mom's room, and they kissed her goodbye. And Brenda was telling me, and I think David was there too, and Brenda, Brenda used to go dancing on Saturday night, and she would always come talk to my mom, and my mom would say, well, Brenda, show me that little dance you did. And um, she, mom was always saying, now, Brenda, you need to marry that guy. He's a doctor. He's good. And... Um, so Brenda said the last time she saw my mom before she went um, into health care, she was telling her about a dance or something, and mom says, well, Brenda, do that little dance for me. And Brenda did, and Brenda said, you know what your mom told me? I said, what did she say? She said, wiggle on, girl, wiggle on. <laughs> and I thought, I thought that was so cute. And my mom did like to, you know, play matchmaker at the Chesapeake and find out what all the the gossip and the news was, Mom will always be in our hearts. I am who I am, so whether you like me or not, a part of that is my mother. Um, my, my family will say that's my mouth, but um, I will never be the woman she was. But I, I love her. I, be, her values were so good. She taught us such good values. She had progressive views. And she was just an amazing person. And she is here right now. Her spirit is here because the, you guys are her favorite people. And this place was her favorite place. She served this church so faithfully. Five generations of our family have gone, attended and baptized and married in the church. She is looking down at us, her family and her friends. Oh, my gosh. And Linda Poinsett sang for my mom. You know mom and dad are up there because they love Linda Poinsett. <laughs> Sorry, Linda, but it's the truth. And um, they, they are so happy. They're probably holding hands and saying, Dad, boy, Linda did a good job. <laughs> and, uh, and have Libby speak? Oh, my goodness. 
I'm sure they are up there together having a good time. Ruth Alma Shelton was an amazing woman. We loved her and will remember her because she was unforgettable. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, my name is David Spain, and I'm Ruth Spain's baby boy. <laughs> I was her literal pride and joy. <laughs> I was her favorite. <laughs> and my brother and sister are nodding their heads, so let's just get that out of the way. As most of you know, mom had me late at 40 and I was a big Spain baby at nine pounds plus. So I was by far one of the biggest pains in her life. <laughs> and she reminded me of it all of my 53 years. David means beloved in Hebrew. And I was beloved by my family, but especially by my mother. We just got along. She was older and we spent a lot of time together. Holding my hand, she would take me to market, the hairdresser, errands, shopping, <laughs> cooking, cleaning, uh, and I got dragged along to every cookout, family event, church event, you name it. I was her sidekick. And by the time I was around seven, Susan and Eddie had moved out or were not spending much time at home. So my, f my earliest memories of my mother was that mom was a caregiver. And caregiving is hard, hard work. She cared extensively for our grandmother. She also cared for Aunt Nancy and Aunt Mary and whatever other elderly Shelton, Minitree, or Spain family member who needed food or a drive to the doctors or a cleanup or just a visit and some companionship. Mom, as the baby of her family, was by default the go-to caregiver for many elderly relatives. And she did just what had to be done, tirelessly. When grandma was finally in a series of nursing homes, mom visited her four to five days a week, taking me along, of course. And ever the dutiful daughter, always the dutiful daughter. And mom did not always receive encouraging words in this task, but she would just suck it up and continue on. When mom became granny, she provided a tremendous amount of love, support, meals, childcare, duty for Amy, Andrew, and Seth. And she loved serving them. She loved watching them. She loved feeding them and loving them and being enmeshed in their growth and development. And mom was finally a caregiver for dad. And that was probably hardest on her. I won't go into too much detail, but after dad died, mom had a gentleman caller from back in the day, from probably 1942, I think. And uh, he was paying a lot of attention to her. And I was all for it and kind of teasing her and encouraging her and quoting her own, life is for the living. <laughs> and she finally got tired of this narrative and she narrowed her eyes as she could do and stared me down and said, I already took care of one old man, I'm not gonna take care of another. <laughs> Mom was one of the best cooks, period. Certainly top three in my unofficial rankings. And uh, Michelle, is, are you here, Julie's mom? There's a vacancy, you get to move up now. So <laughs> congratulations. Um, mom could cook anything and make it taste great. She fed so many people in this audience and they know what I'm talking about. I can see the heads nodding. Um, as we heard today, she grew up in a boarding house and she loved being in the kitchen. I think from those early experiences, she learned how to feed a crowd or make the extra plate when unexpected guests showed up, or how to stretch a meal or stretch leftovers the next day. I could prattle on about her recipes or her rolls or her pimento cheeses, or, but I wanna share some of her cooking experiences that she created. When I was about 10 and in the TAG program, we had to pick an international food. And I chose and insisted on French eclairs. Uh, she smiled and intrigued by the challenge, we made French eclairs from scratch. The pastry, the custard, the chocolate icing. No special tools, no Google, no internet. She just figured it out 
and they were amazing. And compared to everyone else's global glop that was uh, before <laughs> us, uh, our French eclairs were magnifique. Um, and watching the kids and teachers' reaction, uh, I knew my mom was special. Um, mom took every piece of game or fish that was brought into our house and she made it the centerpiece and she made it taste great. Eddie brought home venison, duck, or quail and I would bring in every bluefish, croaker, spot, bass, crappie, perch, bluegill, anything that we could clean it, she would cook it. She would take bluefish, yes bluefish, and put bacon and lemon on it and broil it and I still don't know how she made it taste good but I still like bluefish to this day. She once provided a luncheon for Uncle Red um, when he was getting remarried and she was determined to, imp to impress. So it was cold cucumber soup and pimento cheese sandwiches with the crust cut off, watercress salad and other fancy finger foods all from scratch. And I sat back and I was like, wow, uh, this lady is pulling off uh, a, a pretty impressive spread. She was a Virginia Martha Stewart before Martha Stewart existed. And as, as we've talked about, mom's favorite food was crabs. Her affection for crabs was known throughout the peninsula. She developed a network of sources from the Cereos to the Childresses, uh, Cousin Jerry. They all knew crabs would be put to good use by Ruth. She cooked them inside, she cooked them outside. We had escapee crabs across the kitchen floor and in the patio, and we found them out in the ditch. We cooked so many crabs. Um, she, picked, she picked so many crabs, her fingers got infected. Her obituary, her obituary picture captures her pure joy when she held a large crab. Ruth liked to engage people, and she made an impression on you. So my siblings and I were discussing how to eulogize our mother, <laughs> how to be authentic, and, and how to be true to the spirit of Ruth Spain. She was complex. She had a yin and yang about her. She could be described as spunky, or a provocateur, or an instigator. She had salt, and she had grit, and she had swagger, and she could be tenacious. In foodie terms, she was sweet and spicy and salty with some crunch. She was not a brownie from the grocery store mix. She was a four-note exotic chocolate bar, and that made her far more delicious. As I said, she liked to engage people, and that's not a bad thing. When she engaged you, mostly funny, not always so funny, um, she wanted a reaction. She wanted a connection. And she could be charming in this fashion, and sometimes not so charming. Um, but she had an energy, a glint in her eye, and an inflection in her voice, and she could be playful and risque and funny to all ages. She would find out things about the workers at the Chesapeake, as Susan referenced, and then tease them or make these assumptions, and it would be real and funny and genuine, and they loved her for it. To her family, her words could cajole, criticize, urge, propel, guilt, repudiate, um, but she worked hard, she loved her family, she sacrificed tirelessly for her family, and she held people accountable and held them to a standard. There was no slack in her day to day, and she expected those around her to work equally hard, especially her family. She was, after all, a child of the Depression. Sometimes mom's words could hurt, like a punch in the gut with the efficiency of a pro boxer. Literally, it would make you go, oof. Um, as a teenager or a young adult, I would try to explain away some mistake, some stupid mistake, and she would have none of it. Look at here, boy. <laughs> and then it would be three sentences and a glare, and she would stare you down and, you, and just show you how unhappy she was with you. And because her face was so expressive, and she was somewhat unfiltered, you always knew your standing with Ruth. She could not fake sentiment, or she chose not to. And you pretty much knew where you were with her at all times. Mom was funny. She just had a timing and a style and a rapier wit. The definition of a rapier wit is the ability to deliver witty and cutting remarks. And mom kept, kept her rapier sharp well into old age. About eight years ago, Andrew brought mom to Pennsylvania for Thanksgiving and a visit. 
we went to my mother-in-law's house in Malvern, PA, where various family and friends from my wife's side had gathered for Thanksgiving. Mom was about 86 years young and at this time hard of hearing, but she was having some wine and appetizers and, and feeling playful. There were about 15 of us gathered in this kitchen and dining area, a big open space. And I mentioned, uh, and Mom and I were discussing the difference between a Yankee and a Southern Thanksgiving dinner and the menu. And I mentioned that Jacqueline's Uncle Dave was a picky eater. And he happened to be strolling by in the middle of this group in this open area, and everyone could hear our amplified conversation. Well, Uncle Dave is walking by with his big belly sticking out, and I go, Mom, they don't serve seafood because Uncle Dave is a picky eater. And she goes, well, it sure doesn't look like it. <laughs> <laughs> and the room erupted with laughter. It was cutting, and it was funny, and we talk about it every Thanksgiving. Mom was a super ager, and she aged well. I learned to appreciate mom even more after dad died in 2004. Her children were grown with families of their own, and that lessened some of her angst in her day to day. She no longer had to be a caregiver for anyone and instead was starting to require care for herself. She continued to live in her house, cook these awesome meals, drive, go to church, volunteer, knit countless blankets, and she inevitably began to slow down. When I would come and visit mom in assisted living, mom liked to get out. She would label the Chesapeake as jail <laughs> and the food as bland. And that eating together with the ladies at the Chesapeake was like being transported back to 1940 in Newport News High School or what she imagined lunch in a women's prison to be like. <laughs> so we would go out. And just like in childhood, I was holding her hand as we went place to place. We both liked that. She said my, my hand reminded her of Ivan's hand, and I enjoyed the efficiency of not using a walker or a cane and holding my mom's hand again. And everywhere we went, people would stop and look at us and smile. The size difference between us, the look of absolute trust from her, the simple act of devotion and lending a hand to support an elderly parent. It was easy and it was pure and we just got along. <clears throat> in the last few weeks, mom was in terrible pain. It would come and go, but it was every day and it was pervasive. And it was hard on her and hard on the staff and hard on our family and hard on our friends. And she was so vulnerable and she couldn't hear well or she couldn't see well, but she could still feel touch. I got the call on Monday and rushed down and, around, and arrived around 10. And I'm so grateful for that final night and final opportunity to kiss her and embrace her and scratch her head and to again hold her hand. I want to give a shout out to the compassionate staff at the Chesapeake, those who looked after her. And I want to give a shout out to Eddie and Sharon and Susan and Frank and Amy and Seth and their families for stepping up and helping mom in the last few years but I really want to acknowledge my sister Susan, who like her mother before her, was a dedicated and tireless caregiver. This task of caregiving always seems to fall hardest on the daughters. And in this instance, Susan rose to the challenge. And so before all of these people, I want to acknowledge that you were a great daughter to your mother. And I'll thank you on her behalf. My mom was a bit of a character, and I was always so proud of her for her tenacity, her energy, her bearing, and how she carried herself. From a world in a time where women were not encouraged to have a voice, Ruth Spain had a voice and the guts to use it. I would ask that you please share stories of Ruth with us and with each other. She loves stories of family lore, and she will now take her rightful place in our family history. I'll leave you with the words of what she would say to me anytime I left to go to another city or wherever I was, and to others as they were departing. Remember who you are and remember where you come from. Thank you and thank you for being here to honor my mother.
Well, I'm Eddie Spain. I'm the middle child. <laughs> I don't have all the good stories. I just got a nice poem. And uh, thanks, David, for stealing my last line there. <laughs> because she said that to me long before she said it to you. <laughs> but that's good advice. Okay, this is a, a poem by Henry Van Dyke. It says, I am standing upon the seashore. A ship at my side spreads the white sails to the morning breeze and starts for the blue ocean. She is an object of beauty and strength. I stand to watch her until, at length, she hangs like a speck at while aloud, just where the sea and the sky come to mingle with each other. Then someone at my side says, there she is gone. Gone where? Gone from my sight, that's all. She is just as large and mast and hull and spar as she was when she left my side. She is just as able to bear her load of living freight to her destined port. Her diminished size is not in her. And just at the moment when someone at my side said, there she is gone. There are otherwise w other eyes watching her coming and other voices ready to take up the glad shout. Here she comes. And that is dying. Thank you. What a privilege to be a part of your family today. One of Ruth's favorite hymns, O oh Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. Let us now join in singing the hymn which is numbered 396. And if I might, just before the prayer of thanksgiving, I need to say that I knew Ruth, Shelton, Spain, all of 10 minutes. But I gathered then and I gathered even more today that she was large, 
and in charge. And I'd like to acknowledge the presence of a uh, former pastor here, Reverend uh, Donna Blagg and his wife, Sister Nancy. And uh, um, another moment of personal privilege, since I have to leave before the repast, if I might ask uh, Reverend Don to ask the blessing over the food if no one else has been designated. I'd appreciate that. Thank you so much. Would you pray with me? God of love, we thank you for all with which you have blessed us, even to this day. For the gift of joy in days of health and strength, and for the gifts of your abiding presence and promise in days of pain and grief. We praise you for home and friends, and for our baptism and place in your church, and all who have faithfully lived and died. Above all else, we thank you for Jesus, who knew our griefs, who died our death, and rose for our sake, and who lives and prays for us. And as he taught us, so now we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. According to the riches of God's glory, grant you to be strengthened with might through God's Spirit in your inner being, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And let the church say amen. amen. And now if you will remain standing and sing the final stanza of O oh Jesus I Have Promised. 